Thanks, Terry. It's a pleasure to start off today um, post-lunch and uh, tell you a little bit about the PAPI-2 study and also uh, potentially other collaborative opportunities that we have ongoing or planned at the University of uh, Maryland. So the PAPI-2 study stands for Pharmacogenomics of Antiplatelet Intervention, and of course, uh, 2 means that there was a PAPI-1, and uh, I'll describe that in just a few words uh, in the interest of time. Uh, before I get there, I thought I would just give a wider angle view of um, the programs that are planned or that have been initiated at the University of Maryland's program in personalized medicine. Um, and of course, I'm not going to go through all of these initiatives here, but uh, they basically involve building infrastructure to move from uh, discovery into clinical and translational research, ultimately to develop the evidence base for translation and changing practice. And uh, in the interest of this particular group, I'll uh, bring your attention to uh, the left hand of the slide, the translational initiatives. Um, and I'm not going to go through each of these individually, just to point out, though, that we do have institutional funding to perform a number of translational demonstration projects, uh, several of which are well underway, others that are planned. Um, like other institutions, we're going to make these demonstration projects um, uh, clinician champion driven. We believe that those are the ones that are going to matter and those are the ones that are going to be successful. Uh, CYP2C19 and Clopridogrel is what we'll talk a fair bit about today. But um, we also are very excited about projects that uh, will be initiated in cancer, ID, transplant, and in diabetes. So uh, the PAPI-2 trial, all of you know the CYP2C19 clopridogrel story, the fact that a large number of publications, all of them retrospective in nature, uh, have identified this very common STAR-2 loss of function allele as a major predictor of clopridogrel response. And really, uh, the burden of evidence here in the literature is quite compelling. More than 20 uh, studies performed. Uh, and multiple levels have all converged on the same observation, whether you looked at active metabolite levels by genotype, ex vivo platelet aggregation by genotype, and in a number of studies also cardiovascular events and outcomes. And of course, uh, one of the first things that happens when you get a number of studies over 10 is that the first meta-analysis uh, publication is performed, and again, compelling evidence that uh, this is a variant that matters and that is uh, potentially clinically implementable to uh, save lives in patients who have coronary artery disease and who are, are at a higher risk of recurrent events. And I guess this all culminates with um, a change in the label uh, by the FDA uh, now about a year and a half ago. Uh, this boxed warning uh, alerts physicians to the fact that there are poor metabolizers of CYP2C19, maybe more accurately poor activators of Clopridogrel, since clopridogrel is, an act, is a prodrug that requires activation in the liver, and CYP2C19 seems to be the predominant enzyme that does that. Um, relatively easy genetic tests can be done, since this particular SNP is quite common in the population. There are other loss of function variants, but those are much rarer in most populations. So in essence, a single SNP uh, can be used for an implementable test uh, to predict clopridogrel response and ultimately uh, preempt uh, recurrent cardiovascular events in um, genetically predicted non-responders. Now, many people have better slides and more comprehensive slides than uh, this with regard to defining what the barriers are to implementation, even uh, with a compelling uh, evidence base as there is for the clopridogrel CYP2C19 story. But really, when you get 100 cardiologists into a room and you present them all of the data and you have discussions with them and then you go around the room and each ask, ask each one of them whether they're going to implement CYP2C19 genetic testing in their clinics, every one of them will say, no, of course not. We're not going to do this because there have not been any prospective randomized clinical trials demonstrating that pharmacogenomics improves outcomes, saves costs, et cetera, et cetera. And really, um, uh, having gone to a number of these uh, meetings and uh, having spoken to many cardiologists at my own institution as well as others, um, we were, are completely convinced that uh, this is really the uh, single major um, barrier to implementation. And this realization actually came to us around a year and a half ago, around the time of our renewal application for 
uh, the Pharmacogenomics Research Network and actually was the purpose of our renewal major aim to initiate uh, the PAPI-2 study, a prospective randomized clinical trial of genotype-directed antiplatelet therapy. Our thinking at the time of the application was also driven by uh, Jeff Drazen, who actually was on the scientific advisory board of the panel of the Farm, uh, Pharmacogenomics Research Consortium. And uh, he would say, um, not uncommonly, that uh, prospective randomized clinical trials, uh, at least in the early going, were a good idea. And I think uh, one of the things that uh, uh, I remember well is, is that he would suggest that we just get over with it uh, in terms of doing these prospective clinical trials if we really did believe that genotype mattered. And even more recently, uh, Jeff has written this editorial uh, actually in response to uh, Scott's uh, paper in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, not more than a month or six weeks ago. Uh, and Jeff here is, uh, goes on record as saying um, the next step must be to mount clinical trials in which patients are stratified according to their biological signature to determine whether knowledge of this information leads to better clinical outcomes. And finally, if personalized medicine is going to become a reality, we need to design and execute these critical trials. Now, I'd be the first to say that we can't do, and, and you've heard in this room often, uh, we can't do prospective randomized clinical trials on all gen genotypes, pharmacogenomic and other, that we want to implement into clinical medicine. But it's my firm belief that um, at this uh, juncture in time, in this particular field, with this particular application, a prospective randomized clinical trial is warranted. So uh, this is the background of the birth of the PAPI-2 trial. Uh, you can see here the uh, design. Um, this design actually uh, went through multiple uh, alterations. Um, uh, the first one that we proposed to the FDA was considered unethical. <laughs> Uh, actually because of arguments that Gail had put forth earlier uh, before lunch. And we've ultimately uh, came up uh, with this protocol that we believe will uh, satisfy, actually that we know satisfies the FDA and also uh, will answer the question. And to walk you quickly through it, uh, we're basically going to consent patients who are coming into the cath lab. Uh, and um, once we know that they have stents placed and will be going on an antiplatelet agent, they will be randomized. Um, and they'll be randomized into uh, a genotype-directed uh, arm where the intermediate and poor metabolizers will get the alternative drug, uh, prosegrel, extensive and ultra-metabolizers will get clopridogrel, and that arm will be compared to the standard of care arm, those individuals who will not be genotyped and will get standard dual antiplatelet therapy based upon the clinician's best uh, judgment. And ultimately, uh, one year down the road, we will be monitoring for clinical events, cardiovascular outcomes, and also, of course, a number of secondary um, uh, outcomes. Uh, and uh, we also have a discovery phase in which we wish to use this cohort to discover new variants. Now, you can see that the sample size here is about 3,600 subjects in each arm that will be randomized. So this is a, a large study. Um, uh, but one in which you'll see we still have, I would say, marginal uh, uh, power and for which uh, we hope to seek additional sites, so this is where collaboration comes in, to ultimately, we hope, expand uh, the number of sites and uh, the number of uh, subjects we recruit into this uh, study. You can see here that um, retrospectively, the standard of care group is going to be genotyped. And the primary analysis actually is going to be a composite cardiovascular endpoint in which only the intermediate and poor metabolizers from each arm are going to be compared. So that's about 1,200, 1,000 to 1,200 individuals in each um, arm that will be compared as the primary endpoint. And I won't go through all the details of these secondary endpoints, but you can see uh, that we also will be looking at adverse events such as bleeding. And with uh, Bill Weintraub, one of our collaborators, we uh, will be doing uh, an intensive pharmacoeconomic analysis uh, to see if genotyping um, not only improves outcomes but also saves dollars. Um, again, not going through the complete detail of the organizational structure of PAPI-2, but just to point out that this is a multi-center trial. Uh, we have five sites that are involved, uh, the University of Maryland, 
uh, Hopkins, Sinai Hospital of Baltimore, Geisinger, and Christiana Health Services. So we already have, I guess, three uh, institutions that are already around the table that are part of the PAPI II trial, and uh, as I'll mention, uh, we'll welcome uh, others. So the genotyping platform that we'll be using is a Verigene system. Uh, it's a point-of-care genotyping platform. Uh, can be done in a clear, approved environment and uh, takes about three to four hours turnaround. Uh, these instruments will be landed in each of the five sites. And uh, we've just completed, actually, a validation uh, study in our CLIA uh, certified laboratory. Uh, and you can see that this is a, an assay that actually performs quite well, uh, virtually 100 percent accuracy. Uh, there are some samples in which you get a no call the first time around, but you take the same sample and run it back through the instrument, you then get uh, most of these uh, no calls turn into calls that are uh, quite accurate. So I told you that this is a trial that's large, uh, but uh, we think still is of marginal uh, power. Um, as I've mentioned, we're going to look at uh, one-year cardiovascular events, and the power here shows us that with 1,000 individuals, uh, at least the intensive uh, intermediate and poor metabolizers uh, arms, uh, we have about 80 percent power to detect a difference in events in the standard of care versus genotype-directed arm of 7 percent versus about 4.1 percent. So that's a relative risk reduction of about 60 percent. Um, uh, I think um, uh, one that is not out of the realm of possibility, but um, probably uh, a bit optimistic. So in terms of a progress report, um, we actually have an IRB-approved uh, IRB uh, protocol now. Uh, approval at the other centers is currently in progress. Uh, this uh, trial finally uh, was considered FDA-exempt. Um, and the reason is, is that in the standard of care arm, we don't know the genotype. We're going to be retrospectively genotyping them, and that seemed to satisfy uh, the FDA. Uh, we've convened our DSMB, and uh, recruitment we expect to begin at Maryland uh, uh, in February of 2012 with other sites uh, too soon to come on board. Um, and then uh, ultimately we expect by the spring of 2012 we'll be seeking uh, additional sites in addition to the five. Uh, and uh, contemporaneously uh, looking for funding to uh, open those additional sites. So that's the PAPI-2 trial. Um, I have uh, maybe two other quick um, projects that I thought I'd throw out for potential collaboration by the group. Uh, I told you about our new translational genomics lab. Uh, we're quite proud about our certificate of registration uh, um, inspection to occur a little bit later this year for full uh, certification. And um, essentially what we did at the University of Maryland is we took our genomics core, our research grade genomics core that does everything from single SNP genotyping to uh, next gen sequencing, and we essentially bit the bullet and converted that entire lab into a CLIA approved laboratory, which as you heard is still in progress, and we expect to be able to offer uh, a panoply from single SNPs to next gen sequencing. Um, and we expect that this translational genomics lab will be particularly useful for these uh, essentially translational projects where uh, we have clinical trials, uh, pragmatic, prospective, whatever, uh, in which we uh, believe we need to perform to uh, show that implementation of genomics makes a difference. Um, the TGL, the Translational Genomics Lab, is going to be where we will be performing our genotyping for uh, a related project that I thought I would mention, one that's um, funded through the PGRN called the Translational Pharmacogenomics Project, TPP, and uh, this involves basically six sites, PGRN sites, in which we will be implementing some of the CPIC guidelines that you heard discussed uh, earlier today. Um, and a number of uh, these six uh, groups, uh, sites, are going to be utilizing um, various kinds of genetic testing, uh, uh, ultimately to figure out the science of translation. You heard a little bit about TPMT and thiopurines. Several of our groups are looking at clopridogrel, warfarin, and others are looking more on the preemptive arena with uh, larger arrays, DMET chips, and custom panels. All of this done in clear, proven environments and the six groups working together to develop decision support software for some of the commonly used EMRs, healthcare provider education programs, and also collecting 
metrics to see whether the implementation actually worked and whether it's going to be, uh, whether it has changed uh, uh, clinician practice. Ultimately, uh, an aim of this TPP is to disseminate knowledge, and this is where the rest of you come in uh, and um, would be possible to involve uh, various um, non-PGRN groups in this effort, um, similar to how the CPIC has actually evolved. So in terms of a progress report for TPP, um, we have, uh, have our monthly teleconferences, working groups. Uh, Farm GKB is the site for sharing documents and other information. We've begun to standardize definitions of specific gene drug pairs, taking actual diplotypes into metabolizer or likely metabolizer phenotypes. We're populating various tables that provide information with regard to institution-specific suggested actions that will be useful, we believe, to uh, share and to implement more broadly. And we're developing common outcomes tracking tools that can be used across institutions, uh, tools that will look at the implementation process, changes in prescribing practices, user satisfaction surveys, uh, et cetera, and uh, sharing of educational materials, which we believe is uh, quite important. The last thing I'll mention in the last slide is yet another opportunity for collaboration, and that is the formation of a relatively new consortium, uh, the International Clopidogrel Pharmacogenomics Consortium, uh, ICPC for short. The, con the goal here is to contribute to the evidence base for this particular drug gene pair um, and to be able to um, uh, muster larger, more diverse sample sizes so that we can begin to get uh, a more granular picture of the uh, implications of uh, genetic variation in uh, clopidogrel response. There's more to be learned about CYP2C19, particularly the role of rare variants, which indications are important, ethnic differences, roles of interactions with other drugs, smoking, et cetera. In addition, uh, the group would like to study in a larger way uh, less well-documented candidate genes, particularly ones that might have smaller effect sizes for which larger samples are required. And ultimately, we wish to move this into a discovery uh, format using uh, genome-wide association studies, and we expect probably uh, next-gen uh, sequencing as well. So this international consortium is quite young, uh, but uh, we do have some momentum, and this is a good time to advertise the consortium for potential uh, collaborations. Uh, the consortium will be um, uh, coordinated through Farm GKB, uh, a relatively on an honest, um, relatively impartial broker of um, these kinds of consortia. Uh, we've actually convened our executive committee and have met uh, a couple of times via teleconference. We've begun to have some of those tough decisions about phenotype de definitions, genotype validation, DNA availability, data management, and analyses. Uh, an MOU is now being drafted, and um, uh, we will be um, uh, emailing and uh, inviting individuals from the, uh, into the consortium, uh, initially beginning with clinicaltrials.gov, in which there are 365 listed clopridogrel studies. And um, we welcome uh, uh, these trials, but also other investigators who have interest in participating uh, in the consortium. So um, I think I'll end there and happy to answer questions. Um, let's see, just before we get to Mark, there was another, oh, oh. Uh. <laughs> so, uh, so Alan, a, a couple questions about the, the randomized trial. So first of all, couldn't you get a false negative trial if the physicians are prescribing Prazagrel in your control group? Yeah, this is a moving target mark, and we've talked about this a lot. Uh, and in fact, over the course of the next uh, couple of three or four years, standard of care practices may very well change. Um, we're just going to continue to monitor that. And in addition, as a secondary analysis, we will um, analyze only clopidogrel users in the standard of care arm. And second of all, is there any disadvantage to Prasigrel other than cost? I mean, is this, are we really just talking about the cost of genotyping versus the cost of Prasigrel versus Clopidogrel? 
Well, there's the cost, but also Prostagril is associated with higher bleeding rates. And this is, I think, uh, talking to cardiologists, the primary reason why, at least in the U.S., it's not being used very broadly. Thank you. On the, the question I had uh, related to the last slide where you mentioned a little bit about phenotype definitions, uh, at Intermountain Healthcare, the cardiologists um, elected to do repeat, routine uh, platelet aggregation studies on the patients, uh, which is a phenotypic measure and in some ways is closer to the uh, actual, if you will, um, physiologic uh, mechanism than the genotype where we're inferring uh, phenotype. Um, now, they made this decision prior to some of the more recent data about the reproducibility of that testing, and they may well have changed their mind. But I think it is a salient question across a lot of these activities that if we have the opportunity to measure a phenotype as opposed to a genotype, how do we design studies to determine which is best, and is that something that you're going to build into this? Right. So uh, it's a great question, and this is one of the reasons why this field is so charged with regard to... Uh, any kind of testing, whether it be platelet aggregation or genotype or whatever, you really need to demonstrate that it matters because uh, there is such controversy over platelet function testing. So I, I think the, the, the short answer is that um, probably platelet aggregation testing and genotype will be complementary to each other, um, maybe sequentially, and in fact that was something that we, one of the study designs that we tried to build into this study, but um, how to cut arms somewhere as we realized that costs were, were escalating. So um, we do have an optional visit for platelet aggregation testing at day 10, and we'll, so we will be able to uh, go back and do uh, retrospective forms of analysis to try to compare the two. Yeah, um, just about the <clears throat> logistics, you mentioned that only patients where you, who actually receive a stent will then uh, be going forward f with genotyping. And then you add your uh, turnaround time, et cetera, et cetera. So can you just talk briefly through the expected time frame uh, after the event of a stent being placed? Yeah. And how that fits with the common clinical practice of these patients being discharged if there's no complication quite, quite early? Yes. So we hope to have uh, all patients randomized by the time of their discharge, which is usually the following morning, and we believe we'll be able to do that in virtually all cases. Um, the protocol actually specifies that we can randomize as many as four days out, but of course we'd have to go and chase the patient uh, uh, and, and potentially change their drug. Uh, my cardiology friends tell me that if you're going to change medications, they actually want to reload with Prostagril if they've gotten clopridogrel, and so certainly that would have to be done in the hospital for discharge. So the answer is, is that um, we hope to do the randomization before discharge, in most cases, the following morning. Comments for, uh, for Alan? Super. Thank you very much. Now you can eat your lunch. <laughs> so.